Um, so next we're going to hear from Dr. Kerry Solkowitz. I think I saw him log on, so I know he's here. Um, Carrie, you can turn on um, your video while I do your, your intro. So, so um, I've had the, the pleasure of actually seeing um, Kerry at work. He is a master at what he does. He really, you know, invented the convergence of strategy and psychology or business and psychology. Um, Kerry is a, is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, but actually spends his days um, advising CEOs, senior teams, boards, and startups. Um, they, you know, facing everything. I think this is obviously uncharted territory. And so um, I'll be really interested to, to just have a conversation with Carrie about what he's um, seeing today. Um, Carrie, thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I'm just looking at to make sure we're okay on sound. Okay, we're good on connectivity. So, so big picture, Carrie, let's just dig in. Big picture, um, what's going on right now in, in, your, in the business community? What's happening with your clients or really the, the kind of who's who of the Fortune 500 and startup um, leaders, et cetera? What are you seeing? Well, as you said, this, these are unprecedented times. And uh, as experienced as any of us may be, uh, I don't think any of us have ever seen anything quite like this. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been uh, spending uh, every waking hour, practically, Lucy, uh, speaking with CEOs and management teams and boards around the country. Most of my clients are in the U.S., a few are outside of it. Um, and, um, and frankly, everyone is, uh, is scrambling to, to cope with something of, of a scale that we have really not dealt with before. Um, the way I see it and the way I've been talking with my clients about it, and, it, and it's very much of an evolving situation because uh, I certainly don't have all the answers either in terms of knowing how best to deal with this. But um, the way I see it is that there are, in, in a sense, two pandemics going on at the same time. There's obviously a, a pandemic of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But the but the second one that is intimately connected with the first is really a pandemic of anxiety, pandemic of fear. And um, and that's the part that I try to talk to, to, to the leaders that I work with about. And that's that maybe what we can talk a bit about here. Uh, today. Um, the first thing I'd say about it is that um, it's important to know, and I, I, I think the last speaker's comments about the importance of facts, I, I couldn't agree more with that comment. And one of the facts that's important for, for people to understand who are in business and who are grappling with not only their own emotions, but, but trying to lead their organizations through this situation, is to understand the difference, a, a spectrum of feelings ranging from outright denial, burying one's head in the sand, which I don't think there's that much of that going on, although there still is some. Hmm. Um, that's at one end of the maladaptive spectrum. And at the other end is what I would describe as panic and hysteria, which is also clearly not helpful. And, um, and in the middle, although it's sometimes hard to know where the middle is exactly, is a healthy amount of fear and concern. Um, and, and the reason why I think it's so important to, to think about this spectrum of emotions and trying to pay attention to one's own as leaders first before then being able to help the people that you're leading through it is that, and this is where I think a wartime analogy can, can be helpful. When a war is going on, um, in addition to the, 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 the uh, opposition in a sense wanting to win the war, part of the way they try to win that war is by instilling so much fear in those who are on the receiving end of their attacks that that fear uh, interferes profoundly with our ability to think clearly and to perceive reality clearly. Mm. Um, we're not at war with another country, we're at war with a virus. And it's, um, but I think the analogy is apt because um, I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that our ability to think clearly is really um, uh, entirely linked to our ability to, to survive this. And, um, and if we're not thinking clearly, it, that diminishes our chances. And so I think just labeling the, the spectrum of emotions is, uh, is important. I think that, that the leaders that I work with, you know, they're struggling themselves. It's not like they're having an easy time and, and it's just their employees who are struggling. Everybody is in some ways. And we have to be realistic about that. And um, to, the, to the point of giving hope in, in the previous conversation, I, I agree that, that, that giving hope, certainly if it comes across as giving false hope, that actually backfires. But, um, but I think for leaders to be in touch with that reality and to then come up with concrete plans for sustaining the business, first and foremost, concrete plans for keeping employees safe. Um, that's the first and foremost task. And then the continuity of the business uh, can follow. 
I'd be curious to hear, so I, I think it's brilliant that kind of two pandemics, um, I love the way that you articulated that. Um, Tell me more about the, the specific examples you're hearing and then ha what you're saying in response. So along that spectrum, you know, what are, what are you hearing that's really in that maladaptive fear camp? What are you hearing that's more in that healthy camp? And how are you helping advise them through, through this really, really kind of unchartered time? Sure. Um, first of all, one of the things that I've been advising my, my clients to do, and, uh, and most of them fortunately are responding well to this, um, some of this may seem like motherhood and apple pie, Lucy, but one is that uh, leaders do need to be very present right now. They mm -hmm. need to be speaking to their teams. Again, it may seem obvious, but um, for the leader to go hole up and not communicate right now is, is a mistake. Um, the, uh, an, another, uh, another issue is obviously a lot of work has overnight been converted to virtual, although clearly there are some workers who need, depending on the, the kinds of businesses and the kinds of roles, um, clients in the real estate business, they, 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 they're, they're, they're still people who need to man the buildings and do uh, mm -hmm. basic maintenance, for instance, just as one of a million possible examples. And so to be sensitive to the fact that not everybody um, has what, um, it, in a sense, is the luxury of being able to work virtually, although clearly we're learning a lot about how much can be done virtually right now. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the, the other thing, and you know, like this, this conference being, being done virtually, the, the, the other thing is that um, we need to be thinking about the, um, the implications of working virtually, particularly given that it's, it's highly likely that, that this is going to be going on for months. We obviously have no idea how long this is going on for, and that's what makes it more warlike than uh, analogous to something like a 9-11 or a Hurricane Sandy here in New York, both terribly traumatic events to be sure, and I'm not minimizing that. But, but with those events, um, the, the, the catastrophic event happened and then we dealt with the aftermath for a long time. Right now, we're not in the aftermath phase. This is still a very evolving situation with an indefinite timeline. But in any event, back to the use of virtual uh, technologies, which are really, um, in many ways, life-saving for us and, and business-saving. Um, one of the things that leaders need to be attuned to is uh, and to encourage and almost to give permission for is to not just conduct meetings as many meetings as possible virtually but um but to recognize that one of the things that is missing um is the the, the casual informal kinds of human yeah. contacts that take place in the in the workforce and um and I think over time that's going to get even more difficult because people will have cabin fever that's the mild version or various kinds of anxiety and depression problems uh, and so I think to encourage um, workers to not only have meetings by, in this case, Zoom or what have you, pick your favorite technology, but also um, to uh, encourage workers to socialize via Zoom too. Um, because the social connections that we make at work, we often underestimate the importance, but that's how, mm -hmm. how teams can function better, by, by building trust, uh, by deepening the social bonds that allow teams to perform well. So I think that's something else we need to pay attention to and that uh, I think the more enlightened leaders are, are intuitively doing. Uh, going back to your, to your leaders need to be present piece, because I think that's so, it's so important. What are you saying to the leaders that you're dealing with that really don't know what to say and don't really know how to show up? You know, this is so new for them, um, whether it's a first time leader or it's a leader that's just never been through this kind of complexity and uncertainty. Uh, what, how are you advising them to, to show up? What does that look like? Yeah, well, so uh, perfection is the enemy of the good. Everybody's familiar with that statement, but no, has that never been more true? Um, and I, by the way, I would say, you know, it, uh, it's not like the more experienced leaders are necessarily better than the first time CEOs of a startup, for instance, necessarily. I think mm -hmm. it, 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 sometimes the, the, the startup leaders, first time CEOs are intuitively better. And I think it, it is less in some ways dependent on experience and although experience does count um, and more dependent on uh, the, the personality, the kind of constitution, if you will, of the, of the individuals. But to try to answer your question, Lucy, a bit more specifically, I'm, I'm really saying that you need to speak. It doesn't have to be perfect. It should be brief, but you have to be present. It should be by video, ideally, um, if, uh, which is better than phone. Writing has its, its virtues as well, and frankly, all of the above are, are useful, but the, but the presence part is important. Number two, I would say that, um, 
and again, I apologize in advance if this sounds like it's stating the obvious, but the, the need for sincerity and for something that sounds mm -hmm. unscripted. If, if you spend uh, two days having your marketing department develop your next presentation to your employees about COVID, I would not do that. Hmm. Uh, it'll sound like the marketing department wrote it. No, no, no offense to marketing departments, but I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, it, it needs to just come from the from the heart. Um, it needs to be uh, fact filled, uh, but not overwhelming with facts, because um, I think you have to be um, cognizant of the fact that everybody is anxious to varying degrees, and I think our ability to take in a lot of facts is is limited by anxiety, much less our ability to retain and you know, kind of hold it. So I think that the messages need to be brief. I think if you have two or three things to say to your employees, that's probably plenty. Um, the most important one, I think, is probably about, again, tending to the safety of, of employees and their, their loved ones. Um, and then second, what, you know, what can be done about uh, uh, business continuity and also a sense of in, instilling a sense of responsibility to the broader community. I think that, um, that, that the isolation you know, social distancing and so on that has been has been mentioned is obviously critically important to public health. And I think, again, um, leaders have uh, not just the positional authority as, of, of the boss, but they have moral authority. And I think it's from that position of moral authority that leaders need to uh, support the, the best recommendations coming out of the public health officials in the around the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to make sure people are starting to throw in questions for you, Carrie. So, so um, people who are listening, definitely start to put your questions. And I'm already seeing a few come through on chat and, and the Q&A um, piece. Um, Carrie, I'm curious how you're, how you're handling it. Because obviously you're on the phone and on video with you know, all of these leaders and, and organizations going through these really tough times. And it, I'm sure it's taking a bit of an emotional toll on you as well. Not to mention that you're also in the midst, you're in New York City as am I, where um, definitely there's a heightened sense of, of anxiety and, um, and panic. How are you managing? Any tips on that? <laughs> I appreciate the question. And I think, <laughs> no, I do. And I think that's a good question that we all need to ask each other. Um, by the way, at the beginning of meetings, um, one of the things that I recommend for CEOs, their meetings with their teams, and I will answer your more personal question in a second, Lucy. Um, at the beginning of meetings, I think rather than just diving into the first item on the agenda, which is next year's budget or what have you, um, I think leaders should go around the virtual circle, if you will, and ask each, each person there just to say a bit about how they're doing, kind of the way you just asked me. Um, and uh, you know, just very briefly go around and just to kind of take the, the, this, the, the pulse of the, of the people in the room to see how people are handling emotionally. It's, it's really important to do and shouldn't be underestimated. I'm doing uh, okay under uh, very difficult circumstances. It's, um, I've been hearing a lot of my clients' worries, and I certainly have my own. I'm far from immune to, to any of this. Um, trying to take decent care of myself physically and um, get some exercise every day and, and eat reasonably well. And um, I, I get some, some uh, fulfillment out of trying to help others, but, but uh, you know, one has to take care of oneself first. So I am, I am trying to cope. And um, what helps me is um, it's also just feeling like I'm part of a community. And I think that's the way leaders, by the way, should think of their, their companies. They're not just businesses, but they're also communities. And I think that sense of community right now has, has never been more important. Uh, couldn't agree more. And we've been doing, you know, all this prep and I, you know, you and I were on a call earlier. The first thing we start with is, you know, are you and your loved ones okay and healthy? And I think doing that humanity check is just so important. Um, okay. So we have a bunch of questions and I want to get to some of the ones that I saw. Um, I like this one. Expand a little bit on what you mean when you say moral authority, because I think that is part of this uncharted territory is leaders um, figuring out what that means in terms of their role. So say a little bit more on that. Sure. That's the way I think of an authority in general. When I work with CEOs, one of the things that I tell them is that, you know, you're the boss, you're the, you're the CEO. No, nobody has any doubt about that and that there's a lot of virtue that comes with that, a lot of, a lot of power and authority. Um, but, but if you rely on that alone, you're not going to be a very good leader. You're not going to be a very good CEO. Um, because I think the way to get things done is partly through the positional authority of being the CEO or the leader of a team. Um, but really through uh, the, the quality of your, of your behavior, your values coming through, um, what you model. And I think that um, 
it's the modeling part. It's not unlike uh, the role of parents with their children. If if parents just you know you know uh, clamp down on children and order them to do things, you, you might get them to do what you want them to do, but you'll you won't you certainly won't uh, engender deeper love. And I'm really talking about the, the emotional side of in one case parenting and the other case leadership. And I think now is the time when this what I'm referring to as moral authority. Um, has never been more important. A yeah. simple example, loosely, Lucy, and then we'll get on to another question, is um, the, um, um, you know, if, if your employees see you uh, panicking um, or not complying with the, the, the best practices from a public health point of view, and how can you expect them to, to do that, even if you're uttering the words that they should be doing that? So you know, I think leaders need to know that how they conduct themselves during this crisis is going to be extremely closely scrutinized and um, for better or worse. And so it's an opportunity for leaders to really uh, rise to the occasion. And that's where, again, this moral authority concept, I think, comes in. That's helpful. Um, I think there, there's a couple of more practical questions, which I think I'd be really curious to see, to hear your perspective. How often do you think leaders should be communicating with the full company? When you say, you know, they should be um, being present and not holding up, what, what does that cadence look like? Is there a best practice for that in your mind? Yeah, well, I think we're inventing best practices as we go. Um, I, 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 I certainly don't think that, that, um, that leaders should go more than a week without communicating. Uh, with yeah. their employees. I think in some cases it, it can be uh, quite a bit more frequent than that, even daily. Um, I'm, I'm really hard to, um, to, to say there's a hard and fast rule about a best practice, whether it's you know once a day or once a week, um, just because it varies so much depending on the circumstances of each individual organization, what they're going through. Certainly if there is new news, uh, whether that's a change in the way we're uh, as a society attacking the problem or um, or if there's a, an, a, an employee who has the illness, mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, it, it really varies so much depending on the, the, the circumstances. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't go more than a week. Okay, and I love that we're inventing best practices as we go. I think you're right about that. Um, we got, so I, I'll, I'll be curious to hear your answer on this one, and I thought we might get one like this. So, so how as, a, as an employee or more of an individual contributor or not the kind of leader of the organization, how do you deal with... Um, a, a quote unquote dysfunctional boss, right? What do you do if, you're, if your leader is not showing up the way that you've just described and is actually using, um, using this crisis as an opportunity to, to sort of manifest some of the toxic culture, the toxic behaviors that already exist within the organization? Yeah. And thank you for that question. I, I know that that's, that's a showing up vulnerable. I, we, we really appreciate um, these kinds of questions. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and a, and a hard one. But mm -hmm. let, me try, let me try my best here. Um, clearly, if you if you had a let, let's to use the shorthand a bad boss before this crisis, uh, they may still be a bad boss now. Uh, although although surprisingly, some may rise to the occasion under these uh, under these really difficult circumstances. But um, so I but I'd say a few things. One is um, if if your boss isn't showing up the way that you would like, now is a time to if ever to um, to offer some constructive feedback. Um, that can be offered virtually and all, whatever channel feels safest. And uh, I, I know that that's easier said than done because one of the consequences of having uh, not really good leaders is that they sometimes don't create the, the conditions of emotional safety to give feedback in the first place. But I think that to, to the extent that uh, you can try to overcome whatever inhibition there may be in the workplace culture that you're, that you're living in to offer some feedback and constructive suggestions, I think that would be helpful. The other thing I'd say about this is that, um, and I think this is a broader point, but I think it applies to this issue of dealing with, with toxic uh, leaders, is um, I would make a plea for a greater measure than ever of, of tolerance right now. Tolerance amongst employees, between employees and their leaders, between leaders and from leaders to their employees, really all around, because uh, these conditions of fear that I was talking about at the outset um, they affect all of us in, in so many ways, including bringing out, you know, not, not always the best behavior, and that includes in our bosses. And, um, and so, um, you know, understand that your boss uh, is uh, fearful and struggling with this too. It's not, uh, please don't take that as, a, as, a, as an excuse. Um, but under, but I, think, I think the time for, 
some empathy all around, a greater degree of empathy that can be mustered is, uh, is warranted right now. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll ask two more and then, and then we'll move on to our, to our next speaker. Um, I'm getting at questions about specific examples of manifesting empathy and, le and moral leadership. And I, I know when we talked, you had a couple of really good ones. Um, what are you seeing that you really are saying to yourself that, that that's a really good way to show up in this, in this moment? One of my clients um, runs a, a, a hospitality company. I won't name the, the company, but it's a very large hospitality company. And as, as you can imagine, the, uh, the company, the, the, their, their properties around the world are essentially shut down. And uh, it's a big company, so they're fortunate, uh, unlike a lot of smaller companies that don't have significant cash reserves, um, and, and it's to be able to, to continue to pay people. The, the, the CEO got on a video, he sent around a brief video communication about six or seven minutes long uh, to all their employees worldwide. And this has actually since been released publicly, although it was intended for the employees. And he, get out, he got up there and um, he, uh, he, he, he teared up a few times as he was speaking. He said that, that they were going to try to keep people employed for a month um, and that, they're, that pe but people's jobs right now uh, were essentially to stay home and to contribute to the public good by by social distancing and and uh, self-imposed quarantine in some cases, and um, and you know he he was being honest. He was trying to be generous. He wasn't doing uh, an, an immediate round of layoffs, although the implication was clear that that might be coming, and um, and he also uh, I think showed his own vulnerability which I think is part of the process of, of empathy. I think he was struggling too, and he's been camping out in one of the properties, um, uh, reluctant to go home for fear of uh, infecting his kids. So um, that's one. Uh, a simpler one that, that's more of more one-to-one -one is you know, reaching out one-on-one -on -one to, if you're working in a smaller organization where this is possible, I'd certainly recommend this. In addition to the, the, the larger scale communication to, to you know, to kind of all hands, um, to reach out one to one, just send them a, a, a brief note, just checking in. How are you? How are you doing? How are you? How are you holding up? You know, how's 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 your daughter with asthma doing? You must be you must be concerned about that. Just a show of of care and of being able to get outside yourself. I, I think that's actually a great note to end on. Um, thank you. Really practical and immediately applicable. Um, thank you, Carrie, so much. Um, I hope your you and your loved ones continue to stay healthy and well. Uh, thank you again for joining us.